Dark Souls is a video game that is loved by many, even years after its original release. One of the reasons that it has become so loved is due to its reminiscence of older games, in which you are thrust into a beautiful world and let loose to figure out where to go and what to do. With this level of freedom, the narrative of Dark Souls often feels vague and wrapped in a level of mystery. This vagueness allows the player to draw their own conclusion, theorise and speculate. Namco, the publisher of Dark Souls, even ran a competition for fans to explain the Dark Souls lore. An iceberg is an image containing many theories, with the more common and well-known theories sitting at the top of the iceberg, while the deeper down the iceberg you go, the more obscure and spooky the theories become. Today, we'll be taking an extensive look at the Dark Souls iceberg, created by Scantia over on Reddit. There are a lot of points in this iceberg, with a few either being just speedrun techniques, and others just being made up by Scantia himself. So we are only going to go through the most interesting points in this iceberg. As we go through each theory, I'll have a health meter displaying how likely I think the theory is, with a full bar being that the theory is 100% true, to an empty bar, which means that the theory is close to impossible to be real. Enough of the intro, let's get straight into the theories. The Blighttown Wheel Dog. Blighttown was a shanty town and later became a deposit site for the sewerage and runoff from the above areas, like the Undead Berg and the Depths. One of the most prominent features is a giant water wheel, which provides the player shortcuts from the poison lake below. But did you actually know what makes this wheel spin? If you look closely at the centre of the wheel, a flaming attack dog is actually operating this. Kind of like a hamster in a wheel. Now, if any of you dared to think, what would happen if I killed this faithful doggo? Then you would be sad to hear that it is shielded by an invisible wall and it's also invincible. However, Tumblr user Illusory Wall got around this and directly reduced the dog's HP to kill it. And as you can see, the wheel keeps turning on its own. Basilisks have tiny eyes. Basilisks, which are also known as cursed toads, are one of the most dangerous non-boss enemies in the game, as well as being one of the most intimidating in the game as well. Look at those huge eyes! But wait a minute, are they actually the Basilisk's eyes? These are actually just two bulbous growths, while their actual eyes are tiny black specks underneath. So why would they have such large growths? Animals in the real world, such as butterflies, birds and frogs, also have fake eyes, which they use for intimidation. The Basilisks may also be using these, along with their vocal sac, to intimidate both predators and prey. The Great Hollow Falling Basilisk You may have noticed that when you enter the Great Hollow, something strange happens. You seem to receive 400 free souls without killing any enemy. 400 souls is equal to the number of souls that you obtain from killing a Basilisk. So there's a theory that a Basilisk had fallen through the map somewhere. Jed Lang used a Dark Souls mod tool to look at the map data and confirmed that there actually was a basilisk located outside of the map and underneath where you spawn. Thanks for the free souls, buddy! Duke's Archives Whispers The Duke's Archives is a later area in the game that consists of a giant library, a prison tower, and gardens. If you remain still in the Duke's Archives for long enough, you may start to hear some eerie whispers in the background. Demon's Lantern managed to extract the audio files to make the whispers louder and cleaner. Many fans think that these whispers and cries are from the Maidens, who were abducted by the Channelers. Solaire is the Carthus Sandworm. Solaire is a character you find in the Undead Burg that's looking for the sun. Most players, including myself, will later encounter Solaire as having gone insane. He's finally found a light source, 
but as that of a sunlight maggot which is attached to his face. If you kill Soler and obtain the maggot, its item description reads, A loathsome parasite that inhabits Lost Isolith. It is completely immobile, yet still lives. The popular theory, first written by the attendee, speculates that the maggot grants its host great power so it can keep on living, as a parasite needs a living host. This maggot, over many years, transformed itself and Solaire into a giant worm known as the Carthus Sandworm, which we can find in Dark Souls 3. This theory is most likely not true, as the creator of the Soul series, Hidetaka Miyazaki, explained in the Japanese podcast Game no Shukotaku that if you successfully kill the Sunlight Maggot before he attaches himself to Solaire, he will return to his own world and link the flame. He also stated that the expected Solaire outcome was soon to be taken over by the Sunlight Maggot. I personally like the theory raised by Soul XDD in that Solaire has been turned into a chef, which is why in Dark Souls 3 you can find a lot of Sunlight Medals near all of the Estus soups. That brings us to the end of the Sky segment of the iceberg, with us just being teased into the beginning of the theory realm. Let's delve deeper into the surface of the iceberg. Ornstein is an illusion. Ornstein is believed to be the captain of the Four Knights of Gwyn, and was stationed with Executioner Smo to guard Guinevere. However, there is a theory that Ornstein actually wasn't taking guard in the cathedral, but he was actually an illusion made by Gwendolyn. In Dark Souls 3, Ornstein's Dragon Slayer set indicates that Ornstein left Analondo in search of the Nameless King. During the battle with Ornstein and Smo, one of the characters dies before the other, with the last surviving character consuming the power of the other, and latter, upon they themselves dying, being the only one to drop a soul. These two different events result in different outcomes, so which one is actually meant to happen? In Dark Souls 3, Smo's hammer and armour state that he was the last knight standing in the cathedral. This means that Ornstein would have had to have died first in the battle, so he would never actually obtain his soul. This helps the case that the Ornstein at the cathedral is actually an illusion, while the real Ornstein is out adventuring to find the Nameless King. But this brings up the question, how could Smo become more powerful after absorbing just an illusion? And why could Ornstein's illusions take so many hits, while other illusions, such as Guinevere's, disappear after a single hit? Dark Souls wiki user Butter100Fly suggests that the Ornstein illusion could be enhanced by a soul fragment from the original Ornstein. This can be supported by Seath, who created the Moonlight Butterfly's soul, potentially from his own fragments. Gwendolyn could also have potentially used a piece of Ornstein's soul to create a more powerful illusion of Ornstein while he was away from the cathedral. Jeremiah is the parasitic wall hugger. Venturing back to Blight Town, there is a parasitic wall hugger guarding a pyromancy scroll. Jeremiah, Xanthus King, is a character that's been exiled to the painted world. Do you notice anything similar? Now there are other similarities other than just their looks. Jeremiah uses pyromancy, while the wall hugger protects a pyromancy scroll. Jeremiah uses a whip, and a whip can also be found near the wall hugger. Concept art of Jeremiah even has him with some form of parasitic infection, but that's not as deep as the rabbit hole goes. As to his name, Jeremiah is a king, but what was he a king of? He was also exiled into the painted world, but where would he have been exiled from? Jeremiah's title, Xanthus King, just means Yellow King, which doesn't help us determine what could have been his kingdom. Many theorise that Jeremiah was actually the king of Isolith, Jeremiah appears in a painted world, which Miyazaki stated was a place where a lot of unfinished or cut content was placed. Miyazaki also states in another interview that King Isolith was cut from the game. Could this be the same king that was cut from the world and placed into a world full of cut things? This further supports a similar theory, that the parasitic wall hugger is actually Jeremiah's son. Frizen Seeker found folders of game data that contain the nicknames of enemies with the parasitic wall hugger being called Prince Isolith, or rather, the Prince of Isolith. If Jeremy was the King of Isolith, 
could the parasitic wall hugger be his son? The connections make sense. Havel is not the person trapped inside the tower. Havel the Rock was a bishop who became hollow and was locked in the watchtower basement. Or was he? The theory is that the man who is in the watchtower is actually not Havel, but rather a follower of Havel. This is because if you kill this enemy in the tower, a Havel ring is dropped, which is only given to the followers of Havel. The assumption is that Havel would have been strong enough to wield all of his equipment without needing such a ring. Havel very much despised sorcery. It is possible that he confronted Seath or his experiments with the Maidens, failed and died. After defeating Seath, if you venture back into the room where Seath is first found, there's a soul of a great hero. This could actually be the great hero that is Havel, while the undead in the Watchtower could be a fake who pillaged Havel's body. However, I believe this theory is quite unlikely, as the Watchtower basement key to access the enemy has the description. There are rumours of a hero turned hollow who was locked away by a dear friend. For his own good, of course. This signifies that someone of great importance was locked here, not just any regular follower. Now, let's allow ourselves one deep dive to a lower layer to also explain another Lynx theory, that Havel is the Stone Dragon. This theory, formulated by Reddit user Mistrello, supposes that Havel escaped the tower, ventured to the Ash Lake, and changed his stone armour into the Stone Dragon, which is the original description given to the dragon found at the end of the Great Hollow Ash Lake path. But why would he want to change himself into a dragon? Because Havel needed to defend himself from Seath magic, and dragons are resistant to magic. Maezaki said in an interview that the stone dragon is not alive, the ancient dragons are half living, half element, and that there is no pain for them. Could this mean that the dragon is made from half Havel, half stone? However, this theory kind of falls apart as to explaining who would actually have been inside the tower if it wasn't for Havel. But who knows for sure if it was Havel? Maybe the real Havel lives inside us all. Kalamix is not a cyclops. Kalamix is one of the strongest dragons in the game and looks to have a large, single red eye in the middle of his head. This, like the Basilas, is not true as he actually has two smaller eyes on the side of his head below the large red eye. It's unsure if the big red dot is actually an eye or something like a point of weakness. Killing Kalamix without Goff's help. Kalamis can be found in a giant valley, firing his fire breath at you. This fire breath will nearly instantly kill you, which makes it nearly impossible to fight him without asking for Hawkeye Goff to help shoot down Kalamit, so you can attack him with a melee weapon. YouTuber Kamul78 managed to kill Kalamit without Goff's help, using a strong magic shield and crystal soul spears. With Kalamit having a different death animation, but no victory achieve message was displayed, suggesting that the developers did not expect this scenario to occur. Frampt and Karth are the same being. Kinseeker Frampt and Darkstalker Karth are primordial serpents, each with conflicting goals. Frampt wanting the Age of Fire to continue, and Karth wanting the Age of Dark to return. However, there is a theory detailed by the Spirit Force that there was only ever Karth, with Kingsinger Frampt being a false identity made by Karth. After meeting Karth, who declares Frampt as a liar, you can choose to side with him and turn against Frampt. If you do so, you would expect Frampt to be quite upset, but he just goes back into his hole, claiming, There can be only one chosen undead. I will continue my search. It does seem a bit strange, doesn't it? that Frampt would give up so easily when you have chosen to take the opposite side. Additionally, when Karth's ending is picked, the dialogue Let Karth and Frampt serve your highness. It's quite peculiar that Frampt would switch sides so easily. This theory does have a burning question though. Why have you picked Frampt instead of Karth? Does he not reveal he is Karth and linking the fire was never his true intention? The theory suggests that Frampt is actually testing a candidate for the Dark Lord. If one chooses to go straight to Frampt, then they are not the undead that Karth wants, and the flame lives on, until one that is worthy of the title of Dark Lord appears. If someone is curious enough to venture into the Abyss and find Karth and seek the truth, then they are a candidate. In Dark Souls 3, 
numerous statues are erected of what is most likely France, potentially celebrating the linking of the fire again and again. But remember what Carr said previously? That France was a liar? This is because his true intentions are actually aligned with Carth, and his encouragement over the linking of the fire is just a patient waiting game for their inevitable downfall. Varti Vidya has made a video about the Dark Souls 3 paintings in the Ariandel boss area and how they refer to the serpents. This suggests that Karth and Framft would be different snakes. However, the Spirit Forces theory is also open to Framft and Karth being separate serpents, but just having a similar goal. Now, let's submerge ourselves in the bulk that is the body of the iceberg. Item Burden still exists. Item Burdening is a game mechanic in many games like Skyrim and Demon's Souls where the weight of items carried are measured and limited to a specific value. Instead of removing this feature from Demon's Souls to Dark Souls, the developers instead set the hidden weight limit to a number that is impossible to reach during a glitchless playthrough, being 10,000. Through the use of glitches such as the quantity storage, a player can achieve a weight of 10,000 quite easily. If a player then tries to grab another item with weight, it causes this item to be dropped and the number of the items dropped is calculated by the total overburdened weight divided by the item's individual weight. This is then used to duplicate items. It's unknown whether the remastered version still contains this 10,000 weight cap as the quantity storage glitch has been removed. Theoretically, this limit could still be reached. You could buy thousands upon thousands of weapons to reach this. One of the heaviest weapons that can be bought, the giant shield from the giant blacksmith, has a weight of 18. To reach a weight over 10,000, you would need 556 giant shields, and with them costing 10,000 souls apiece, this will set you back a mere 5.56 million souls. As people were using this exploit to duplicate weapons, it seems like it would be easier now to just obtain multiple of the weapons that you'll want to duplicate in the first place. Butchers are female. The butchers are non-respawnable enemies that appear in the depths, and they seem to be preparing some sort of a meal. Around this, you find Laurentius, who is trapped in a barrel. After he has been rescued, he thanks you, saying, I would have been a supper without you. She'll have me for lunch. This is often a place where many refer to the butchers being female. Except butchers primarily butcher their meat and don't eat it. Behind the first butcher's preparing table is a chute, which seems to be where the butchers are delivering their food. At the bottom of the chute is a giant rat. This would suggest that Laurentius is referring to the rat as eating him alive, opposed to the butchers. Although, this theory is pretty much factual, as Maizaki has stated that the enemy cooks are ladies too. Although this could be some sort of mistranslation. Boulder levers move on its own. Sen's fortress is full of traps such as swinging axes, pitfalls and boulders. These boulders have set paths that they roll down, with a lever at the top of the fortress determining which way the boulder falls. As you walk through Sen's fortress, the boulders seem to be redirected towards the player's location. Last Dodo Bird has a video of the boulders seemingly changing directions on their own. But it's still more likely that the triggers are actually just invisible. Visiting the town under Firelink. If you look out from beyond the graveyard, you can see that there is a town at the bottom of a cliff. The look and location of the town makes it unclear what it could represent. But could a player unknowingly visit this location throughout their playthrough? There are dirt patches in Blight Town walls that imply a passageway to this area could indeed exist. YouTuber Crest managed to explore this area using developer mode and discovered that it's not a fully designed city. As you can see, there's a lot of early designs and textures here that are not finished and it doesn't seem like you could walk in this location. Therefore, a player wouldn't really be able to visit this town without exploiting the game. Tarkus did not die by gravity. Iron Knight Tarkus is an NPC most known for traversing through Sen's fortress that's full of many treacherous traps. His corpse can be later found to the left of the painted world canvas, with the placement making many believe that he became unbalanced on the beams above and ultimately fell to his death, with his body being dragged into the corner by the painting guardians. But why would someone who has conquered one of the most frustrating areas of Dark Souls 
then clumsily fall from the rafters. Some speculate that he may have been too heavy and fallen off, but these beams seem to be the same width as the last beam in Sen's fortress. Another theory suggests that Tarkas didn't fall by gravity, but he was actually overwhelmed by the painting guards in the chapel. However, with the armor he is wearing, the painting guardians would probably barely damage him. A theory that I like is that the iron golem actually threw him all the way into the chapel through the now broken window, with Tarkas then dying upon impact. Although this ruins the fact that Tarkas is the most powerful in all of Dark Souls, and no one can tell me otherwise. Now it's time for us to put our scuba gear on and get to the bottom of this iceberg. Andre moving the Firelink statue. Starting off the bottom of the iceberg, we have more of a little known fact rather than a theory. Andre is a blacksmith that can be found in the basement of a church in the Undead Parish. Originally, he was actually meant to have a far more important role in the story. The development team originally planned for Andre to be the son of Gwyn and move the statue that would give the protagonist access to the last area of the game, the Kiln of the First Flame. The statue is theorised to be Gwyn's mother and Gwyn, with Andre being Gwyn's son and tasked to protect the door, ultimately letting the player progress. If you look closely in the statue in the finished game, it actually looks like it could be movable. There's also an unused cutscene that has been left in the game data of the statue being moved. In the end, Andre's relationship with Gwyn was removed from the final game, and now he is just a simple, beloved blacksmith. The Duke's archives isn't the only place that you can stop to listen and hear creepy sounds. Players have reported that when they're in Analondo, they have heard someone else running around and going through doors. If we go back and revisit the ambient sound files that were captured by Demon's Lantern, we can actually observe that the sounds of walking and doors opening are actually part of the ambient music. Some suggest that this is due to the timeline in Dark Souls being distorted, so we can actually hear footsteps from the past. Like the whispering you can hear in the Duke's archives, they're from people who still lived in the city in the past. The Gaping Dragon was in Blight Town. If you thought our most popular place in Dark Souls couldn't get any more juicier, you'd be wrong. The Gaping Dragon is an ancient dragon who is said to have been mutated and twisted through its own desires to eat. We first meet the Gaping Dragon climbing up into its arena, and as a player, you can never survive a fall off the cliff that he climbed up from. But where would this have actually led to? A dragon scale located in Lower Blight Town might hold a clue to this. Located in a pit behind the bonfire, it's speculated that this is the pit where the gaping dragon actually climbed from, meaning that it was originally from Blight Town. If we have a look at the 3D map viewer, we can see that the areas nearly match up. The lower half of the red section is the cliff that the gaping dragon climbs up onto, while the tube just at the edge of this is where the dragon scale is located. I think the placements of these locations are a little more than just a coincidence. Broken Arch Tree from Ash Lake was a portal to Belataria. Ash Lake is a beautiful, serene location that is often missed while playing Dark Souls. Giant arch trees dominate the landscape, which each of them said to be containing a part of a world. One of the great hollow trees that we can access goes from the Ash Lake up to Blight Town while another looks like it goes from Lost Isolith to beyond the Firelink Shrine. This is used as an alternative theory to how some of the NPCs arrive from other lands. Instead of being transported by the crow, travelling between the great distance of worlds could be done between these trees. Ash Lake acts as a hub system for all of these worlds. There's one arch tree that sticks out in Ash Lake, and it's not like the others. Instead of standing tall, this one has been felled, but it doesn't appear to be rotten. In fact, it looks like it's been snapped in half. Bulletaria is the land in Demon Souls, and there are many theories that Dark Souls and Demon Souls are linked, with references and connections made between the two. Unfortunately, Demon Souls was released as a PlayStation exclusive, while Dark Souls was not, so Demon Souls may have had to have been cut out of Dark Souls. Could this have been depicted by a snapped tree, 
with its world also seemingly cut off from the rest? I personally think that this tree does not lead to Bellatarium. As one of the most supported links between Demon Souls and Dark Souls is that Demon Souls references Dark Souls as the land of the giants. But in Dark Souls, the giants were actually a race, and they were considered lesser beings, definitely not the owners of the land. Nito's third coffin. Nito, one of the last bosses in the game, resides over the catacombs and can be found within the Tomb of the Giants. You'll find him in a massive coffin, with an empty coffin beside him. But did you know that there's a third, often unseen coffin here? You can just barely see it here. Dark Souls dissectionist, Illusory Wall, and many other Dark Souls theorists make many connections between Nito and the often comically displayed Pinwheel. It's often stated that Pinwheel is an admirer and copycat of Nito, and attempts to be like Nito himself. One large piece of evidence for this is that there's a skeleton that Pinwheel is working on when you first encounter him. This skeleton has a long curved blade attached in the place of its right hand. Does this look familiar? It's almost as if Pinwheel was trying to recreate Nito. But what happens if Pinwheel had already recreated Nito before? Perhaps Pinwheel themselves is an attempted recreation of Nito. A lot of people use the evidence of Pinwheel's theme song that he's a fusion of three people. Concept Art of Pinwheel also displays himself as an amalgamation of three members. Some speculate that this concept art has actually been drawn over an official art book drawing. But further evidence is through Pinwheel's Japanese name, Sanin Hoyori, which translates to the three-person coat or three-person weave. Perhaps Nito himself was once three entities and is now combined, only leaving the other two coffins behind. This theory, while certainly curious, doesn't seem to fit the full picture for me. Why would Pinwheel be constantly cloning himself? And why are the masks of Pinwheel that of a family? With the mask of the father, the mask of the mother, and the mask of a child. GameFrag's user, Unbound King, presents a more tragic theory. Perhaps Pinwheel was a member of the Gravelord Covenant, and through initiation, had to lose his wife and child. Like Nito had to. Ultimately though, the father would grow to regret his decision, and rebelled. He stole the right of kindling, and fled from Nito's domain. The father attempted to resurrect his wife and child, but in his attempt, he created the abomination that is the Pinwheel. Now in his new form, Pinwheel is still sane, and spends his life studying and experimenting, searching for a way to separate himself from his wife and child, but tragically, can only create clones of himself. I'm not really sure if this ended up being more of a Nito's third coffin theory or a pinwheel life story, but let's move on. Quailana used rapport on Laurentius. Remember Laurentius, the man that was saved from the confines of the barrels near the butchers? After he is saved, he appears in Firelink, where he offers to teach you pyromancy. If you later upgrade your flame with Quailana, Laurentius is fascinated by your power and will ask where you obtain such a power from. If you tell him where Quailana is, Laurentius will travel to Blight Town himself, seemingly to obtain or study this power for himself. Later, if he ventures to Blight Town, you will find him there. Hello, yet yeah, there doesn't seem to be any explanation as to why this would have happened. Or maybe none that are easily proven. The theory that Laurentius, a man who was fascinated by the Chaos Pyromancy, reminded Quailana of the catastrophe that was created by her mother, and how it moulded them into deformed creatures. She could see similarities with Laurentius, and how he would become devoured by the flame, losing himself. Quailana then could have used Undead Rapport on Laurentius to make him an ally, and then inevitably hollow. Interestingly, the description of the Undead Rapport reads, the living are lured by the flame, and this could be a subtle connection to how Laurentius is lured by pyromancy, with this spell being his ultimate downfall. The last sentence of the Undead Rapport is perhaps the most curious part. It can be used by either gender. There are no gender exclusive spells in Dark Souls. So could this be hinting that both genders have used this spell? You are a male character in the game, and Quailana is female. This could imply that Quailana has used this spell, maybe even on Laurentius. 
A more likely explanation is that undead rapport is similar to a charming spell, and that sometimes can only be used on opposite genders. As for Laurentius, it's more likely that he was not able to see Qualana, which caused him to lose hope and then hollow. Now we have to hop into our submarine and withhold the intensity that's the dark water. 12 Kings Boss Battle The 4 Kings Boss Battle usually consists of 4 kings that spawn periodically, with you having to kill all 4 of these kings. However, it seems that more than 4 can actually be spawned. YouTuber Limit Breakers explains this perfectly in his video, How many kings can you spawn in the 4 Kings Boss Battle? And I suggest that you have a look at his video if you want a more detailed explanation. In summary, weapons that deal bonus damage actually only deal that damage to the individual king and not to the total health bar of the four kings. This means that a total of 12 kings can actually be spawned during the boss fight. Griggs is a spy sent to kill Logan. Griggs is a sorcerer that you find locked in a room at the undead burg. He is searching for his master and can be seen following Logan through the game continuously and almost suspiciously too much. Griggs himself justifies it by saying, No, the reason I seek Logan is, well, it's really my own conceit now, isn't it? Now you won't be alone if you had some confusion actually understanding what that really meant. I spent an embarrassing long time trying to research exactly what this meant and still could be incredibly wrong, so keep that in mind. The word conceit means to have excessive pride in oneself, similar to vanity. In the context that Griggs used this, it suggests that it's his own prideful opinion for why he's following Logan, and that he won't share that reason with you. This could simply be referring to his infatuation with Logan, and nothing sinister, but this is only the beginning of the more concrete evidence. Upon initially saving Griggs, he states that he has an important task at hand, which is an odd way to put an adventure to find your mentor. Griggs also wears a black sorcerer set, which has a description worn by the secret sorcerers at Vinheim Dragon School. They secretly worked with sound-based spells and never reveal themselves. Griggs also sells certain spells and drops the slumbering dragon crest ring, which reads, secretly worn by a certain surreptitious, which means secret, sorcerer at Vinheim Dragon School. It seems that Griggs has quite a lot to hide. It's theorised that Griggs is actually sent to keep taps on his master Logan, with Griggs tasked to keep Logan's knowledge secret, which is why he's so determined to follow Logan through more dangerous areas such as Sen's Fortress, with his real intention actually being to silence Logan before he gives away too much secret information. Yulia is the female undead merchant. Near a bonfire in the undead burg, there's an undead merchant that sells loot that he has taken from the corpse of fallen adventurers. He often mentions his companion Yulia while stroking a barrel next to him. But who really is Yulia? One theory is that Yulia is actually the female undead merchant that you find in the shortcut between Firelink and Undead Burg. Originally, she was trapped in the now broken barrel next to the undead merchant, but somehow she managed to escape. This could be what the undead male merchant is alluding to when saying, You'd never leave my side now, would you, Yulia? Possibly him being in denial that Yulia ran away from him, crossed with the fact that he could very well be insane. Not convinced with this theory yet? The broken barrel looks very similar to the one that you find Laurentius in, so a person could definitely fit in that barrel. The male undead merchant also warns that Yulia will bite your fingers off, which is really the only sort of defense that someone could do if they were stuck inside a barrel. You can also purchase the resident key from the undead merchant. That allows you to open the room where Griggs is in. But do you want to guess what else is in that room? Lots and lots of barrels. And also a corpse. In a barrel. Old habits seem to die hard for the undead merchant. Sen is the Crystal Knight. The Crystal Knight is an enemy found wearing a crystal themed set of armor and is mentioned minimally throughout the game. There's speculation that the man wearing this is in fact the same person who created Sen's fortress. Going back to the Crystal Knight's armor, it contains quite distinct design patterns. These designs are very similar to a triple bolted crossbow called Avalon, created by a weapon craftsman Edis. This trait of multiple bolts 
being shot at once is only found in one other place, Sen's Fortress. YouTuber AGR Cactus also points out that the banister design in the Duke's archives also shares a very similar pattern. So Edis could have been the architect of Sen Fortress, meaning that it could have been called Edis Fortress, which means that Edis could have been Sen. However, it's unclear why they would have changed the name. I think due to the lack of connections between Sen and Edis in terms of the names, and the other pieces of the puzzle most likely being coincidence, Velka is a corpse in the asylum. In the Undead Asylum, there is a corpse that seemingly met their fate with a sack on their head, blinding them. There's speculation that this could be Velka, or one of her followers. In Japanese mythology, crows are seen as servants of the gods, being sent out as a form of divine intervention within the world of the mortals. Through this, connections can be made between the giant crow transporting you to and from the Undead Asylum, and Velka, who had a strong link with the crows. Hawkshaw theorizes that the sack has been placed on the head of the individual to withhold identity, and that perhaps the crow is not actually waiting for you to escape the Undead Asylum, but actually was waiting for Velka herself. This is strengthened by the fact that you can trade a sack with the crow for a demon's great hammer. Such a great reward for an item that seems of little worth as a sack. Because there's such little concrete information about Velka, there is room for many ideas, but also room for error. I think that a high possibility could have been that the sack was just placed on the prisoner's head before they walked through the corridors to meet their execution. Ash Lake Scale Identity Ash Lake does not only contain arch trees and stone dragons, there's a huge skull that dominates the beach landscape of some unknown creature. Some speculate that it could be the skull of a dragon, however, the shape of this skull seems quite different, with dragons and dark souls having quite a snout-like appearance. The theory of the skull's identity is quite a complex one, with YouTuber Hawkshaw creating an extensively detailed video, and I'd recommend you check out their video if you want a more in-depth explanation for this. In a brief summary, the theory is that the skull is that of a nameless blacksmith deity, with the blacksmith having to harvest titanite chunks from these ash trees, due to the rune on a titanite chunk translating to the trees holding up the earth and the heavens. This, as we previously mentioned, seems to be depicting the arch trees. Hawkshaw has done so much research into this that it's definitely possible, and I feel quite bad saying that it's not possible at all. But this definitely does lead into a realm of overthinking what the developers actually intended. Time is not convoluted. Many people justify the complex narratives, the use of multiplayer, and the summoning of NPC characters after they have died through the means of time. Solaire mentions that the flow of time itself is convoluted. The flow of time itself is convoluted, with heroes centuries old phasing in and out. Twitter user Loki has mentioned that time being convoluted was actually a mistranslation of time being stagnant in Dark Souls. Time can absolutely not be convoluted. Supported by theories on this iceberg, such as Ornstein being an illusion, and the arch trees linking worlds. And for me, it would definitely make the lore a lot more exciting with many mysteries and theories still to be solved if time wasn't convoluted. That brings us to the end of a deep iceberg that is Dark Souls. If that Dark Souls mystery still hasn't been itched for you, don't be disheartened as there is so much more content out there. With YouTubers such as Hawkshaw and Illusory Wall that I've referenced throughout this video, I recommend you check them out. And another big thank you to Scantia for firstly creating this iceberg and secondly, being able to answer all the stupid questions that I had. I hope this iceberg lived up to your expectation and thanks to you for watching this video and making it this far through. It really means a lot to me, especially as it's the first time I've delved into this kind of content. Thanks again for watching.